Um, but we take a, a little bit of a break there. Uh, you, you have a sense of our views, but there are essentially two issues here. Uh, whether there was an agreement between the parties to change the terms of the contract, uh, and if there wasn't, whether the uh, owners should be responsible for the underperformance caused by the excessive delay. Um, I don't know, perhaps by a show of hands, how many people here in the room today were convinced that there was an agreement that was reached in the telephone conversation between the two parties? Maybe put your hands up if you think that there was an agreement. Also, there was, uh, and there was not an agreement? How many people felt there was? Okay, and, and how many people in this room felt that uh, the owner should be responsible for the cleaning, even though it was a long port stay under Charter's instructions that caused the fouling? And how many felt that the Charter's should be the ones to pay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's now, now, at this point, the parties have finished the arbitration, and they then think, well, now, we've seen how it's going. Why don't we see if we can have a mediation to, to settle it before the arbitrators come back with their award? So we are, are going to go off and do other things for a moment, and the mediator, Mr. Lux, is going to come up uh, and take our place and see if there is some way in which mediation might bring a solution to this problem. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as a previous speaker remarked, the timing is almost perfect. I should have sat down having concluded the mediation about 10 minutes ago. I hope you'll allow me at least to start. Um, let me actually start by thanking uh, Francesco Lauro and his excellent team for a most memorable event. Um, I ask you, though, for this afternoon to assume that it's a different Francesco Lauro who is representing the Charters, because otherwise I would have to declare a conflict of interest and recuse myself. Um, when I'm standing up, it's to explain what's going on. When I sit down over there, it will be to assume the role of mediator in this dispute. Now, um, how many of you have taken part in a mediation and are therefore broadly familiar with the procedure? So, a majority have not. Let me just therefore explain briefly what would um, typically happen. Um, you would have, uh, for starters, three separate rooms as a minimum, or at least one room for each party, and then uh, an another room for the mediator and to hold the plenary session when all parties get together in the same room with the mediator. For this afternoon, <coughs> I think we're going to organize it in, uh, in this way, that when we're in plenary session, it will be like this, and when I'm in private caucus session with one of the parties, the other team will withdraw from the stage and I ask you to assume that um, uh, they will not be within earshot of, of the discussion. Now, before today, in a normal mediation, there would have been the following stages. First of all, there will have been a formal mediation agreement signed. Very important document, com covers a number of uh, really important terms. There will have been uh, position papers uh, exchanged between the parties and sent to the mediator. And unusually, well, uniquely really, it doesn't exist in arbitration or court, each party can send the mediator a mediator's eyes only paper. And you may be thinking, hang on, isn't that a breach of the rules of natural justice that one party uh, has private access to the mediator? And the answer is, well, that's okay because the mediator is not acting as a judge or arbitrator. He's not making any decision. 
so the rules of natural justice don't apply. Then hopefully the parties will have agreed a slim bundle of documents which they uh, send across to the mediator. Uh, in practice, uh, often it's um, uh, too many lever arch files which are sent across. Um, then uh, after that and before the main mediation hearing, certainly it's my practice to speak with each of the parties, well, either to meet or at least to speak with them. And the objective is to establish various important things, the most important of which is that there will be a senior uh, client representative on each side with full authority to conclude settlement. And there are other important points. Just one brief story. I mean, I recall that one of these pre-mediation uh, discussions, there was um, uh, an Indian party on one side with very little uh, experience of mediation and a Texan party on the other side. Um, the Indians were a little bit nervous, so they told me they were proposing to send along only one junior claims handler to the mediation, and the Texans, on the other hand, were proposing to deploy their full litigation team, plus clients, plus experts. Now, you can imagine that um, a mediation with such a constellation would have had zero prospect of success. So, in fact, quite a lot of time was then spent in pre-mediation hearing discussions to persuade both parties that it was in their joint best interest to have reasonably balanced teams in attendance at the hearing. Um, then, so having um, followed those steps, the mediation hearing uh, itself starts and different mediators follow uh, different practices. Um, some mediators uh, keep the parties in separate rooms throughout in what are called private caucus sessions. Um, other mediators uh, keep the parties in the same room throughout. Um, I do neither of those. I tend to start with each party in separate rooms. I think that's important. It's probably the first time that I'm meeting the lay clients on each side. And it's important that they gain the confidence that I've read the papers, that I understand uh, their case. So I spend a certain amount of time with each party. Then typically there would be a plenary session and we're going to start now with such a plenary session. It will be a very short one because obviously um, the parties, as it happens, have just explained everything, uh, the nature of their case and so on. So it's going to be a short plenary session. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming along to the um, mediation session today. Perhaps we could start just by introducing ourselves. Um, I'm Jonathan Lux, your appointed mediator for today. Um, please um, do call me Jonathan. Indeed, I hope we can agree, all of us, to be on first name terms. So I think you're the claimants. Um, perhaps you could uh, introduce yourselves and tell me uh, your role here today. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Yanis uh, Trifilis. Uh, I'm happy to you, for you to call me Yanis, obviously. Uh, I'm an owner as representative, uh, the principal for the owners. And we have a ship management company with a young fleet, and I've been in the business, and my family's been in the business for a few generations. So um, in this situation, he's our partner. We had a disagreement. Uh, he wanted us to go Yanis, thank you very okay. much. That's very helpful. Okay. And you will, of course, have an opportunity to explain more fully um, the issues that bring us here today. I'm David Pitlarge, a partner in Hill Dickinson, the firm which acts for the owners, for Mr. Trifilis, and has done so for a long time. Um, we've been representing the owners throughout this arbitration and this dispute. Uh, and, David, you're happy that we're on first name oh, terms. And very much. Thank so. you. Thank you, John. 
Hi, I'm Leonardo Rodinella from Deep Pocket, a major bulk operator. We have many vessels in time charter. We are one of the major players in the dry bulk segment. Uh, we are studio Legale Lauro, Francesco Lauro. Um, we have uh, many clients among ship owners, but also charters. And we represent them not only in litigation, but also in commercial agreement, contractual activity. And uh, we try to assist their uh, needs in the best possible way. Good. Thank you very much. Now, I should start by mentioning that <coughs> I've checked uh, conflict and I've seen that I have no other involvement for either parties, so um, that's clear. Um, I'm also aware that um, you've recently been um, in arbitration and that um, you've deployed the legal arguments that um, each of you have before the arbitrators. You've each helpfully uh, given me a summary of those arguments. I should, however, explain my role uh, in this matter, just so there's no confusion um, right from the beginning. I'm neither a judge nor an arbitrator. Uh, indeed, I have no power to decide anything, so um, it would not be a good use of your time to um, address the legal arguments to me. Um, however, um, we will be uh, looking into the wider interest that each party may have. Um, the process itself, I should say a few words about that. Um, it is without prejudice, which means that you can freely uh, bandy around figures without those uh, being in any way binding if, um, uh, if this mediation is unsuccessful. Uh, and just pausing there, it may be counterintuitive, but despite the fact that I have no uh, coercive powers, um, I should explain that about 90% of mediations are in fact successful, uh, successful that is, in bringing about a settlement. So obviously we must strive to make this one of the 90% and uh, not one of the 10% or so. So it's um, without prejudice. Um, it is also non-binding in the sense that in theory, either party can get up and leave at any stage. In practice, I will use my relatively large bulk to block the exit door if I perceive that there is any realistic hope um, of a settlement being achieved. And then finally, it is confidential uh, and the mediation as a whole is confidential, and in a sense, if that's not tautologous, when we go into private caucus session, it's doubly confidential in that nothing that I hear from one party in private will be disclosed to the other party without express consent. Now, um, that's enough from me. As I say, I've got the summaries of your cases, is there anything um, either of you would like to add before we go into, before we break this plenary session and go into <laughs> private caucus session? David. Uh, the pleadings and the submissions in the arbitration represent the owner's position. Um, we have reflected and can see some commercial attractions in possibly mediating a solution, but that should not diminish our conviction that both on the law and the facts, our case is a very strong one. Indeed, following the hearing, we felt that the evidence came out well and in our favor. We were convinced that the arbitrators fully understood that Mr. Trefilis's account was by far the most uh, compelling uh, and our position is every bit as strong as it was in the arbitration. Thank you, David. That, that's very clear. As I said, I won't have any power to make any decision and hopefully, um, your constructive approach to the possibility of settlement will mean that you don't need to go back to the arbitrators um, for a decision. Um, do you have anything to add, Leonardo Francesco? Well, uh, I think we 
had this arbitration hearing, we await for the result. Is, is this the scenario, right? I'm sorry? And we appointed our arbitrator or there was already... Um, yes, I think technically what, what I've been informed is that um, agreement was reached between the parties that to, if you like, suspend the arbitration okay. before the arbitrators rendered uh, any award. Um, but of course, each of you has liberty to go back to the arbitrators if no satisfactory conclusion is reached. Today okay, if mediation. this is the position, uh, I think we have a very uh, experienced tribunal. Uh, we could see from the faces that the of the arbitrators that notwithstanding uh, uh, Mr. Pitt Large, uh, you know, defended his clients in uh, the most, the best possible way. And I think that this is, in our opinion, a uh, uh, win case, a won case. But as you said before, uh, we are here with an open mind, uh, as Mr. Rosinella has always in his meetings and in conversation. And, uh, uh, we respect the owner, so if we could find a way to uh, arrive to a better solution that uh, an award uh, in terms of potential cooperation between the parties, but uh, we consider uh, you know, a favorable award as already achieved in our favor between the parties. So to be, I think we have to be frank and uh, tell this to tell this, uh, first of all, the owners, and then also it's better that the mediator knows. Thank I don't you, know that's... if Leonardo would like yes. to add anything. Leonardo. Uh, yeah. Irrespective of the award of the arbitrators, I will uh, underline the, the good cooperation between the parties, a long, long time cooperation. That, uh, uh, we have some strict rules regarding our procedures, how to treat the, the, the time charter clauses, but this is, does not necessarily mean that we are not uh, open-minded to discuss a favorable uh, commercial agreement with the counterparty. <clears throat> Good. Well, that, that's extremely helpful, if I may say so. I've heard both of the lawyers tell me how convinced they are that um, each of them will win. But, Leonardo, um, you've stressed um, um, the importance of the relationship, which, of course, is, is a very important matter. And, uh, Francesco, you've also added that you came here with an open mind. And in my experience, um, um, a mind is a bit like a parachute, it works best when it's open, so thank you for that. Um, if I may, I will hold the first caucus session with the um, claimants, and so if you wouldn't mind um, withdrawing, and then I will ask the, um, yes, thank you, I will ask the owners to come and look. Major, which is not a mock question. <laughs> I mean, from the client perspective, uh, mediation and arbitration, they are also costs. What percentage-wise, generally speaking, is uh, the cost of mediation towards the cost of arbitration? That's a really good question. And um, yes, there are lots of ways of um, making arbitration um, economic. I mean, there's small claims procedure. One can agree to hold the arbitration on documents rather than have an oral hearing. But in very broad terms, if you're comparing a full-scale arbitration with a mediation, then potentially you've got cost savings in the region of 80%, uh, if not more, because um, typically, if you're talking of, say, uh, what would be an average, maybe a five-day hearing, if it's a fairly weighty matter with witnesses warranting an oral hearing, you may be talking of a five-day hearing. Um, it's very rare for a mediation to exceed one day. And given that time and costs are 
very closely linked. That's why I talk of potentially cost savings of 80% um, or so. Thank you. That was my experience too, from the client point of view.